Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to come out this morning. Today, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene held a press conference to share her thoughts about the leader of her party in the House, Speaker Mike Johnson. We have a speaker, Mike Johnson, that we all, by the way, I elected him. I voted for that man. So I have every right to be standing here. It wasn't a choice of America. Green is not happy. Because last month, Johnson helped pass a bill that sent an additional $61 billion in aid to Ukraine. And that, in Green's eyes, was a betrayal to the Republican Party. Now she is planning to introduce what's called a motion to vacate. Essentially, she's trying to kick Mike Johnson out of his job as speaker. And I voted for Mike Johnson because his voting record before he became speaker was conservative. He voted against funding Ukraine. He was solidly pro-life. He voted to secure the border. He voted to fight against Democrats, fight against the witch hunt against President Trump. But once he became speaker, he has become a man that none of us recognize. A man that none of us recognize. A lot of Johnson's allies would disagree with that. But it does speak to something strange that's been happening over the past six months since Johnson was chosen as speaker. This ultra-conservative MAGA Republican suddenly has some support from House Democrats. Specifically, Democrats have vowed publicly to go to bat for Johnson and give him the votes that he needs to remain speaker, even if some of his fellow Republicans turn against him. And the story of how that happened, it says a lot about Johnson, his political savvy, and how he's navigated this moment. As I've said many times, I don't uh, walk around this building being worried about a motion to vacate. I have to do my job. We, we did. I've, I've done here what I believe to be the right thing, and that is to allow the House to work its will. And as I've said, you do the right thing and you let the chips fall where they may. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. It's Wednesday, May 1st. Today, we are talking about Mike Johnson. We'll hear about his improbable path to Speaker of the House, the political shifts that he's made since becoming Speaker, and why the foreign aid package that Congress passed last month was such a huge win for him. And we'll talk about the future, whether he will survive this attempt to remove him from leadership, and what kind of Speaker he could become if he manages to hang on to the job. To unpack all of this, I sat down with my colleague, Mariana Sotomayor. She covers Congress for The Post. Mariana, do you remember when you first learned about Mike Johnson, like first heard his name or just like heard about him as a congressman? So I was on the Hill when Mike Johnson was first elected in 2016, but he has always remained kind of a backbencher Republican, you know, very big policy wonk. And a lot of us, a lot of reporters, staffers, even members, I heard a lot from say, I don't know who Mike Johnson is. I don't know much about him. However, he's gone from this kind of obscure, no one really knows who he was. Even members of the House did not really know him personally. Went from that and just catapulted to being Speaker of the House. So before he was even, you know, considered for his current job um, or before he even got to Congress, I'm just curious, like, what was his life path to this moment? Like, where is he from and what did he do before Congress? What are the issues that have motivated him in, in his career? Mike Johnson was born and raised and still lives in Shreveport, Louisiana. He grew up very conservative. He to this day, calls himself a Reagan Republican. That was the era that he grew up in. And he is very much an extreme conservative and considers himself part of this MAGA Trump movement. Early on in his career, this is before he entered politics, he practiced as a constitutional lawyer and backed some pretty controversial decisions. In the early 2000s, the Supreme Court struck down laws that made homosexual intimacy illegal. And Mike Johnson at the time 
was publicly very much against that, saying that homosexuality should be banned. It should be illegal. And, you know, he is of the Southern Baptist faith and has often talked about how his beliefs really dictate what he does and what he believes when it comes to politics. What we need is a supernatural intervention from the God of the universe, the God who in whom we trust. It's emblazoned upon the... Here he is right talking to a Christian nationalist pastor before he became speaker. This is an inflection point. We're at a civilizational moment. The only question is, is God going to allow our nation to enter a time of judgment for our collective sins, which his mercy and grace have held back for some time? Or is he going to give us one more chance to restore the foundations and return to him? And members have at times, you know, commented that he delivers these type of sermons. And whenever you ask him, you know, why do you believe whatever the issue is, he will relate it back to God. That is something that is very core to him, is is his religious identity. I also want to talk about his role in defending Trump after the 2020 election um, and basically providing legal arguments why he felt it was valid for Congress to try to essentially overturn the election results. How did Johnson play a role in that? And what were we hearing from him in that moment after the 2020 election? Johnson played a pretty critical role to be able to amass support from House Republicans to back the idea that the 2020 election was rigged and should be overturned. He actually was the one who filed a brief to the Supreme Court, I believe with over 120 Republicans that he was able to get sign on to this, which essentially said that the Supreme Court should overturn the election results. He just did not believe that it was legitimate in any way. Madam Speaker, we have a solemn responsibility today. We must vote to sustain objections to states of electors submitted by states that we genuinely believe clearly violated the Constitution and the presidential election of 2020. This is the... And I should add that during the second Trump impeachment following the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, because Johnson is a constitutional lawyer, Johnson was the one who really helped craft a legal argument behind what their statements were saying. So this is something that he truly believed in and played a role in the House to ensure, and it has since said, I should say, election integrity has become an issue for Republicans. It's become and remained an issue for him. And when he was first elected speaker, Johnson was asked many a time, do you, act, do, you, do you believe truly still that the election was rigged? And it was questions that he tried to dodge, but at one point did say, you know, there were legitimate questions to be asked at that time. Interesting. So in some ways, what you're describing of Johnson and who he was, what his reputation was up until he became speaker is kind of complicated. Like, on the one hand, he was pretty under the radar. He didn't make much of a splash. But at the same time, he is so, A, profoundly conservative and um, a member of the religious right, a Christian nationalist, also essentially an election denier. And so it seems like that puts him pretty squarely in the heart of where a lot of the Republican Party is right now. Given all of that, can you just describe, like, how did this guy end up as essentially the last man standing when it came to the the process of replacing Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House last year? So to understand how Mike Johnson became Speaker of the House, we have to go back to early 2023 when Kevin McCarthy was looking to become Speaker of the House. We know our job will not be easy. We know the task. We've got a close majority. We're going to have to work together. And we want to work with anyone that wants to make America stronger. We want to work with anyone. He's a Republican from California who had been in Congress for almost two decades and pretty much served in leadership for just that same exact amount of time. Many Republicans did not like him because they saw him as this establishment figure. They did not think he was conservative enough because he it did take him a long time to support former President Donald Trump. And some people just didn't like him personally. They felt like they could not trust him because he would make a lot of promises 
only to turn around and break them. In order to win the speaker's gavel, McCarthy had to make a lot of promises. A lot of them stemmed from government funding, how to fund the government, slashing a significant amount of spending. When the time came for House Republicans to finally try and fund the government by the end of September 2023, a lot of the promises that McCarthy made about cutting spending came back to haunt him. He was unable to fulfill a number of them because those same hardliners who had made those demands were also doing unprecedented things like sinking key procedural votes that allow any kind of floor debate because they didn't like the shape of a bill. They didn't think that this one bill cut enough spending, all of that. And it really was 24 hours for McCarthy to realize, oh my gosh, the government could shut down. So he decided he was going to do something a little different that we often do not see for big legislative items, which is since I can't get a simple majority of Republicans to agree, I am going to put a short-term government funding bill on the floor that requires two-thirds support of the House. So that implies that Republicans would need Democrats to be able to pass this, and that's exactly what happened. That was enough for a number of Republicans to say, okay, you have broken all the promises along the way. And Matt Gates, who is a Republican from Florida, big Trump supporter, very anti-McCarthy for many personal reasons, three days after McCarthy ended up relying on Democrats to fund the government, Gates ended up motioning to vacate McCarthy. Mr. Speaker, my friend from Oklahoma says that my colleagues and I who don't support Kevin McCarthy would plunge the House and the country into chaos. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. The one thing... That the and House within that day, we saw Democrats not come forward to help save McCarthy, which means that eight Republicans, including Matt Gates, voted to oust him. It was the first time in history that we saw an ouster of the Speaker of the House by his own party. The yeas are 216. The nays are 210. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. So once McCarthy was ousted, Republicans didn't really have a speaker. During that three-week period, Republicans were back and forth between one closed-door meeting to another, trying to elect a Speaker of the House. And because Democrats were not going to help elect a Republican Speaker of the House, Republicans knew they needed to get 218 members on their side of the aisle to unite around a Republican candidate for Speaker. They couldn't find one. It took three weeks and three unsuccessful Republican candidates to land on this relatively unknown Republican lawmaker, who we now know is Mike Johnson. Many Republican colleagues had heard of Johnson, had met him, thought he was really nice, knew he was very principled and conservative, but really didn't know much else about him. They didn't know anything really about his leadership style because he really had never been elevated into such a position, nor did he really seek it out. So it's kind of a running joke now among Republican lawmakers, and Johnson has kind of alluded to this as well. The reason he was able to get all Republicans to vote for him as speaker was because he never made anyone upset. To my colleagues, I, I want to thank you all for the trust that you have instilled in me to lead us in this historic and unprecedented moment that we're in. The challenge before us is great, but the time for action is now, and I will not let you down. So I've seen in many different places this nickname for Johnson, 
quote, the accidental speaker. Um, and that it's part of this narrative that Johnson, that the speakership just sort of fell into his lap. But I do question that narrative a lot because Johnson is clearly a very savvy politician, um, a very strategic person. And I was hoping you can speak to that side of things, like how Johnson navigated himself in uh, Congress that led to this opportunity and him stepping into this role. I think accidental may be a little too far in, in, because Johnson clearly had showed some want to become speaker. So it wasn't necessarily an accident. But, you know, one could say that he never really strived to become Speaker of the House because he never really did all the things that you had to do to show Republicans in the conference, okay, this person wants to move up. Those things are going out and fundraising for your colleagues, making relationships with donors so that you can become this fundraising powerhouse, which Johnson is not. Um, He did not really travel to districts to campaign alongside his colleagues. He barely campaigned at home and would barely fundraise for himself at home. So, like, those are all the things that, you know, when someone starts to position themselves, you see those things happening. And Johnson never really did all of those external things outside of the House to position himself for higher up in leadership. And both reporters, staffers, and lawmakers alike were like, we're all going to find out who this guy is together. After the break, Mike Johnson's rocky first six months as speaker. We'll be right back. So, Mariana, I'm curious. It's been six months since Mike Johnson became Speaker of the House. Um, As we talked about when he was elected, nobody really knew a lot about him. So what have we learned in the past six months? Like, what kind of speaker has Johnson turned out to be? So something that I've heard from all Republicans, including those who actually may support ousting him as speaker is that he is very genuine. People believe that he is speaking the truth when he talks to them. And they really feel like, unlike McCarthy, who would be breaking promises all the time, Johnson, as as one Republican put it to me, would never stab you in the back and would never stab you in the front. He just is not that kind of personality. So a lot of people have described Johnson as professorial. And in some ways, people say that based on just how he looks. You know, he has his very defining glasses. He's always walking with a stack of papers, a binder from one place to another. So I think a little bit is is the look. But another part of it, too, is because he is so wonky on policy, he will get lost in the press conferences talking about specific parts of a bill and really explaining what it does, what it means, the consequences of those things. Let me read you that provision. Everybody Google this. You can check it out. It's 8 U.S.C. 1182F. We also call it Section 212F of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Do people find him to be a boring speaker? I think it depends who you ask. Um, some members have found him and the way that he explains policy and tries to explain the dynamics of the small margin. They're like, all right, can we talk about something else? I've definitely heard those those complaints before. Um, But other lawmakers say maybe it is better to have a speaker who isn't bombastic, who isn't always drawing controversy, who who isn't always saying the wrong things or, or things that could be misconstrued as wrong. They kind of are able to feel a little confident that the speaker has thought about what he's going to say before he says it. And what about Johnson's relationship with Democrats? Like, what do Democrats think of him? So Democrats, like Republican critics of Johnson, say, well, you can at least trust Mike Johnson. He is genuine in conversations. He has formed somewhat of a relationship with minority leader Hakeem Jeffries, and and so far has been able to follow through on a lot of the things that he said 
Republicans and, and the House generally would do. For example, funding the government, uh, passing a Ukraine bill, as well as a number of other foreign aid bills. Those are certain things that Democrats like, and they realize, okay, he's doing the right thing for the House. He's actually leaning on us because he needs that. Like, we respect him on that front. But when it comes to policy, when it comes to who Johnson is and what he has believed all his life, I mean, Democrats are very critical of him. Um, you know, some Democrats, if, if the question were to be posed eventually of, you know, would they help save Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House? Some Democrats are just not going to let that happen because they don't want to vote for someone who they see as an extreme election denier, as someone who does not support the LGBTQ community, as someone who still echoes a lot of the rhetoric that former President Donald Trump and the MAGA movement have said about migrants at the border, for example, Democrats are not shy about pointing that out. And I should say, some of those criticisms are ones that I've also heard from more moderate Republicans. They have always had this feeling of precaution with Johnson, and, and they have been very tough on him, is my understanding, behind closed doors about not putting controversial uh, legislation on the floor, not putting legislation that, you know, Mike Johnson would support um, because they are so conservative because he now represents a majority of Republicans. Swing swing district Republicans are adamant that he also represent their more moderate points of view. Interesting. So they're basically like, do not put things on the House floor, even if you like them because they're conservative things, because we as moderate Republicans don't want to vote for them, and more importantly, because they would be bad for us in an election year. Totally. And these are conversations I've heard about since the moment that Johnson became speaker. Moderate Republicans going in to meet with him and saying, hey, we've heard about your record and what you've said in the past about the LGBTQ community. This same-sex marriage is now a settled issue. Do not put any kinds of bills discriminating against members of the community on the House floor because we represent those people. There's also been a lot of moderates who have gone into the speaker's office and said that he should not be putting any kind of abortion legislation on the floor. Of course, some of them think of it through an electoral lens, but a lot of these more moderate Republicans also argue that the party is somewhat out of step with a lot of their restrictions and that members shouldn't be voting on a federal ban. And Johnson, for his part so far, has not put any of these very controversial pieces of legislation on the floor, even though Congressman Mike Johnson would have supported it. There was no questions about how conservative Mike Johnson is and technically remains. But as we have seen, the role of the speaker really does change people. And I wonder, how much do you think that change is genuine in terms of uh, his attitudes towards the importance of compromise, the importance of respect across the aisle, and how much of it is politically motivated or part of his savvy in terms of how he wants to be seen in this new job? I think a lot of it is circumstantial. So where he finds himself right now is with a Democratic president and a Democratic-led Senate. I do think that Johnson has changed in the speakership because he now receives, for example, the highest level of intelligence briefings. He has more or less said that that has changed him versus the only things that he used to listen to and talk to were, you know, the misinformation coming from the MAGA base. He has been pretty honest with his conference about getting as much information as possible before making major decisions. So that probably leads into how he has acted over the last several months, how he has spearheaded a number of bills, even though it has angered his Republican colleagues. But we could know a completely different Johnson if the Senate were under Republican control and President Trump were in the White House. I mean, we hear Johnson all the time saying, oh, my gosh, we could do so many more things in the House Republican majority if we had all three pillars of government in this way. And, you know, we have seen him stand next to Trump and say, we need to pass more election integrity bills. There are a number of things that, you know, if he 
did not have to just think about governing with Democrats. I'm sure he would be supporting and pushing legislation that is very different than what Republicans are putting on the floor today. So I want to turn to this bill that was passed more than a week ago at this point um, that's going to send aid to Ukraine and Israel. Can you help me understand why this became such a flashpoint for Republicans and, and why this issue became so divisive and toxic? Well, it all has to do with ideological purity, and that is what the far right wants. Far-right members have been adamant for a very long time to cut spending. And that's a Republican issue. For a long time, Republicans want to curtail the influence of the federal government. Far-right lawmakers, though, want to do it in such an extreme way. It's actually not realistic to implement it in the ways that they have pitched. That's why you see a number of governing Republicans say, nope, we, we have to fund the government. So you're seeing a break on that front in that way. When it comes to Ukraine, it's kind of similar because it has to do with spending. Far right members do not want to give any money to Ukraine. The U.S. has already given over $100 billion to Ukraine over the last two years. Many Republicans saying enough is enough. There are some Republicans who say I want to help Ukraine, but we should put, you know, more more parameters in there to make sure that the spending, the money is being spent well. Things like that have divided the conference into like a thousand little fractures, which, again, makes it so impossible to appease all of these different factions when their razor thin majority is getting slimmer and slimmer as the weeks go by. So Johnson ultimately put a funding bill for Ukraine on the House floor, even though there was much controversy within the Republican conference. And it was the only vote that day that a majority of Republicans voted against. So Johnson really needed to rely on Democrats to pass this through the House. And so because of that, the House was able to pass this $61 billion bill for Ukraine aid to the Senate, and the president signed that, as well as the Israel and Indo-Pacific bills into law. So this was considered a pretty significant moment for Johnson, but also, as you alluded to, he got a lot of blowback. And we know that Marjorie Taylor Greene is vowing to introduce a motion in the next week to oust Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House. The important thing that people have to understand here, though, is that Democrats have said that if it comes to that, they will protect Johnson and give him the votes that he needs to remain speaker. We heard House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries talk about this uh, over a month ago on Face the Nation before the Ukraine bill was passed. Will you protect Speaker Johnson from a motion to vacate if he takes that vote? Will you prevent him from being ousted? We haven't had that conversation as a caucus But I have made the observation that I believe there are a reasonable number of members, if the speaker were to do the right thing, that don't believe that he should fall as a result of it. And even this week, Jeffries put out a new statement saying they will vote to table Green's motion to vacate. They will not let her succeed in her effort to kick out Mike Johnson. Mariana, I'm curious about why you think Democrats are willing to help Johnson here and why they see it being in their interest to make sure that Johnson remains speaker. We've heard from a whole lot of Democrats, actually, some of whom say, you know, if if it's Green who files the motion, they're definitely going to help Johnson because they just don't like Congresswoman Green. There's many others who say, you know, if Johnson does the right thing in funding Ukraine, We will help them if that is the reason why these Republicans are upset. Of course, Johnson has fulfilled that promise. So there are a number of Democrats who would be willing to save him. I have also heard, though, from many Democrats who say, well, if we're going to help him, we might as well try and extract some concessions from Republicans, from the speaker, maybe to work in a more bipartisan manner. So it's going to be interesting to see whether Democrats still hold true to that promise of helping him. So in this moment, it seems like Johnson has succeeded. He's passed these aid bills, even though it 
seemed up in the air for a while. What comes next? And do you think Johnson has become more powerful over the course of this process? And how do you think he will use that power going forward? Well, both Johnson and I would say the House Republican majority are at a point where they actually don't have that much that they must do. Johnson took the speakership at a time when there were so many critical deadlines, had to fund the government, had to pass several reauthorizations. He had to address the global crisis and send foreign aid to our allies. Those are big, consequential things that the House had to do, Congress had to do, the president had to sign it to law. We don't have those kinds of threats in the next couple of months. Yes, there is a reauthorization in the middle of May for the Federal Aviation Administration. But really, besides that, there isn't any critical must-pass legislation. So Republicans can resort back to just passing messaging bills, you know, statements of principles that they know that a Democratic Senate is not going to take up. The next big deadline is September 30th. That's when the government has to be funded again. So probably in the next couple of months, the House Appropriations Committee is going to be busy writing up those bills. But as we remember, the spending fight was insane last year. And a lot of Republicans trying to prevent that kind of chaos on the House floor from being shown again and preventing it from leading to the ouster of a speaker, which is how McCarthy actually got ousted last year. But also, I want to point out that uh, obviously this is an election year. And in addition to every member of the House, um, you know, being up for election again, if they're if they're running for re-election, we have the presidential election. Johnson has already demonstrated that he is an election denier. And despite all of this praise for him shepherding through this foreign aid package, making sure that the U.S. continues to defend Ukraine, I mean, the reality is, is that he has already demonstrated that he's willing to support someone trying to overturn legitimate election results. What does it mean that someone like him is going to be in a crucial position of power going into this election? I mean, we all remember that Johnson was one of the lead, if not the lead Republican, trying to convince a number of his Republican lawmakers to sign onto a Supreme Court amicus brief, essentially saying, hey, Supreme Court, please invalidate the election results. So. A lot of people think that may not be that different, depending on what the outcome is in the presidential election. And you are correct if you assumed that House Democrats are actually using this as a huge talking point on the campaign trail. You know, when, when they're talking about preserving democracy, which is one of the big issues that Democrats are campaigning on, they very much bring up the fact if you keep House Republicans in the majority, we do not know how they will comport themselves when it comes to verifying the election results. If you don't want another January 6th to happen again, make sure that House Democrats are the ones in the majority. Mariana, thank you so much for uh, talking to me about all this and, and explaining this. Really appreciate it. Of course. Happy to help. Mariana Sotomayor covers Congress for The Post. In light of all these questions about Mike Johnson's political future... You will also be interested to hear about some results from yesterday's special election in New York. The seat for the state's 26th congressional district is going to a Democrat, a state senator named Tim Kennedy. And that's important because once he's officially sworn in, the Republican majority in the House will be shaved down to just one vote, giving Johnson and Republican leadership an even smaller margin for error and setting up an even more competitive fight for control of the House this fall. That's it for Post Reports. 
Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced by Peter Bresnan. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Ted Muldoon. Thank you to Rachel Van Dongen. If you want to show your support for the show, please subscribe to The Washington Post. Not only is it a great way to help us continue to do this work, but you can now get access to Washington Post podcasts ad-free in Apple Podcasts. Subscribe in Apple Podcasts or by following the link in our show notes. I'm Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post.